Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Music Policy Forum Live. This is Michael Bracey joining you from just outside of Washington, uh, D.C. As always, we are absolutely thrilled that you're spending some of your Friday with us. We know uh, these are remarkably busy times for people in the music community, and there are uh, be between life and, and music and the SBA uh, shuttered venues uh, operator grant window opening tomorrow. Uh, it's just announced that that is formally going to reopen tomorrow. And everything else happening in our world, we know that you have a lot going on and, and it means a lot to us that you are spending some of your Friday with us. Uh, we've got a, a great group today uh, of guests uh, talking about reopening, talking about reimagining, talking about the role of cultural infrastructure, um, all the sort of interrelated topics that we talk about uh, during our program. Uh, again, for those of you who join us every week, you know how this goes. For those of you who are new, uh, if you're inclined to, don't feel obligated, but if you're so inclined, uh, feel free to put your name and, your, and uh, where you're joining us from in the chat. We'll be taking questions uh, through the Q&A window. Um, if you have uh, specific questions for a guest or conversation topics that you would love to raise, otherwise, you know, feel free to provide commentary in the chat as we go. Um, this program uh, will be a part of our archive uh, that we uh, have that we're very proud of at musicpolicyforum.org. And if you see something in today's program that you think uh, your friends or colleagues uh, would enjoy, please feel free to share the link when we go live with it uh, later this week. And one last piece of housekeeping, again, for those of you who, who join us every week, you know that we uh, very much value and rely on our ACE producer, Alex. Our ACE producer, Alex, uh, is running a different conference today. So I am flying solo. If there are technical hiccups or challenges, we will blame Alex and Doc his pay for not being able to join us. So with that, um, I'm going to run a little video here that's going to help set up um, our first guest, uh, Rachel Moore, the president and CEO of the Music Center in Los Angeles, um, a pretty remarkable institution. And this video is going to, if I can figure out how to do it, this video is going to provide a little bit of background uh, in terms of what the Music Center is and the scale of their work. So let's start with this video.
Rachel, join us. Welcome. Hello. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, You're busy. <laughs> we um we love in this program to you know really start just kind of being centered pre-pandemic, right? Because ultimately we have to spend a lot of time, and we will spend some time today talking about how we're navigating the pandemic and, and getting restarted. But you know, ultimately this is about work we've all have done for a long time before, and and are excited to carry on to the future. And um, I'm reminded seeing that that clip of last week's program, just a similar clip around the Tree Fort Music Fest in Boise, and just how ready I think we all are to get right back at it and uh, just feeling like we're, we're right on the cusp. So, so how are you, and let's just start to kind of big picture, how are you and how's the center and, and I, sort of what are the mechanics of where you are in your process about getting ready to reopen and, and start to build schedules and, and all that good stuff? So like most, uh, last March 13th, we shut down everything and the theaters, the indoor theaters remain closed. Um, we had to lay off or furlough around 1,100 employees, which was incredibly hard. Um, we uh, have been working with the state of California and the LA County about reopening guidelines. And it took a long time for them to even lay out the options of it because LA County was hit so hard by COVID. Um, there's a four color tier system and purple being the worst. And we were in purple for a long time. Um, we are clawing our way out. Um, the uh, guidelines have been released. We look at it as more a, um, turning up the volume as opposed to an on and off switch. So we will, starting in May, uh, have um, outdoor performances socially distanced, which we're super excited about. Um, we uh, produce a big dance series, and so we're bringing in four different dance companies. Um, each will have a week residency where they'll do um, five performances and people will be in pods and uh, get to see the performers perform. And it will be incredible to actually have artists working um, with an audience and being sort of being able to get together. Uh, and then we will continue to sort of open things further. I'm going to expect that the fall will be the first time we have the theaters indoors actually open. Um, in this past year, um, we've been, actually using a lot of the spaces indoor for film shoots. So that's been sort of our, our attempt at <laughs> having a little earned income. Um, uh, but like most, we have pivoted to a digital platforms. I think that it's been uh, really good for us and for a lot of people in the performing arts. We hadn't taken digital as seriously as we needed to, or it wasn't a priority, or there was always something else. And this pandemic really was a kick in the tuchus that we needed to um, strengthen our digital chops. And as we emerge, we will have hybrid experiences where we live stream and whatever. I don't think we're ever going back to just um, proscenium-based work or live work. I think that uh, digital is here to stay and it's really exciting. And my hope is that people don't see it simply as a bridge to get through COVID, but rather as a way to enrich uh, the artistic experience. Um, Cause I think that's what our patrons want. And I think that's where the future lies, um, but it's not easy to do well. And so we need to be mindful uh, around it. But um, I actually am really excited at the prospects of being able to have a broader reach and possibly explore things like uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, immersive work. I, I think that it's, we're entering this incredibly different world um, and you can either you know, shy away from it, but I think we should as artists embrace it and run with it. Um, because that's what's going to ensure our relevancy going into further in the 21st century. Now, you used a kind of a really interesting word, uh, the word patron. And I would love to explore, again, maybe talk a tiny bit about your charter and your mission and sort of the organization itself. Why does it exist and how is it structured? And then let's connect that into who you think you're intended to serve or need to serve and, and what does it look like in mm -hmm. practice? Mm -hmm. 
So the Music Center was built um, at the same time Lincoln Center and Kennedy Center in the early 60s when the arts were really about these white temples to classical art and people drove in, parked, saw the art and left. And the people were white, wealthy folk <laughs> watching white art. <laughs> um, and the world has changed and um, we have changed. Um, the Music Center is structured in that we have uh, resident companies. So the LA Philharmonic rents Disney Hall from us. Center Theater Group, our theater company, rents the Mark Tate Perform and the Amundsen Theater from us. And the um, LA Opera um, rents uh, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And then the LA Master Chorale is also in Disney Hall. And then, um, you know, we also, the Music Center per se, Inc., um, brings in dance. So we are the dance folks. So we bring in, you know, the American Ballet Theaters or the Alvin Ailey's. And, and because of our theaters are so big, the Chandler is about 3,400 seats. We are the pretty much the only game in town that can bring these giant companies. And if it weren't for us bringing these giant companies, they just really wouldn't hit LA, um, which would be a tragedy. So we feel that, you know, that, that piece of dance is very important to us, um, that sort of centered, rooted in a much more traditional uh, art form, but um, incredibly important. I showed up about five years ago and was given the mandate by the board around relevance. And so we really wanted to look at ourselves about what is our value proposition to the broader community. And so we changed our vision to become deepening the cultural life of every resident of LA County. And that language was very um, specific in that it was outward facing. It wasn't, you know, uh, about us. It was about the people we serve. We are, um, the buildings and the land are owned by the county. We are a county asset. We take our public mandate incredibly seriously. I feel that we have a moral obligation to serve every taxpayer in LA County. Um, and LA County is huge. It's the size of Connecticut um, with 10 million people. We are arguably one of the most diverse counties in the country. Um, so we really need to be mindful that our work um, engages with all sorts of groups. And I think that we've also, um, when I came in, we restructured our artistic offerings. And instead of saying, oh, we have dance over here, engagement stuff here, education, I brought in um, a woman, Josephine Ramirez, to uh, be our head of what we call the Music Center Arts, our arts division. And her job is to ensure that we use engagement as our curatorial lens so that everything we do has to be thought of how does this deepen the cultural life of every resident? Not that every program does that, but we need to be mindful that we are um, um, reaching out and working with all sorts of different kinds of artists and arts groups. And, and, and further, we've talked a lot about how the, the performing privileged sort of proscenium art, you know, the we are going to do this art for you is one bucket of art you can do. There's another bucket, which is we have artists and we're going to create art with people. And then um, we are, there's a third bucket where we have folks creating art for themselves, mm -hmm. you know, so, and the traditional structure is that the four is very privileged and these other sort of buckets, we think all three are important because how somebody engages is incredibly important and, and it can happen in myriad ways. Um, and we have put together um, partner networks with artists because we, this is not about us conferring anything upon the community. This is our jointly co-creating, co-curating work with the community and with artists from Los Angeles County and elsewhere. Um, it is, we take a much more humble stance about who we are and what we can do. Um, we are facilitators and um, supporters um, because art, the capability of creating art is within all of us. 
And I think that until, until we get away from that, the artist lives on a pedestal and we should, they, they're untouchable. They're not, they're gonna be easily dismissed because they're living in a little isolated bubble of uh, privilege. And that is not what art should be about in my opinion. It's, it's um, needs to speak to the heart and the soul of everyone and, and how we connect with people that way. Um, I think there's huge opportunities and I'm really excited, you know, that we're sort of going into this new world where we um, uh, are, in, are interacting and engaging with people in lots of different ways in the arts. It's not just coming into a theater or sitting quietly and watching something on stage. And a big part of, of where you were headed or, or where you're just sort of in the early days of doing is the activation around the plaza before the mm -hmm. show and, and really thinking about your physical plant and, and what that, you know, sort of the implications of that space. Can you speak a little to the plaza and kind of your vision for that as, as we get back to opening up? Yeah, so um, the plaza, which is a beautiful space, originally, you know, when we were in the 60s, it was the place that rich people walked through to get to a theater. So we embarked on a $40 million renovation and we, um, flattened it out and we put in big, um, uh, we're up on a sort of a hill that we put big escalators and made a front door. So it's very clear that it's super welcoming. And we have a giant fountain in this middle that can be um, shut down, giant plasma screens, a new sound system so that we have um, uh, ambient art um, on the screens and music going very uh uh, frequently, uh, certainly pre-COVID. And then we um, uh, added a bunch of restaurants, um, restaurants with different price points, because once again, um, somebody who is of limited means can't have a $15 burger. So, you know, we have tur tur uh, tacos and burgers, but we also have a wine bar and um, uh, a restaurant where we have a, we call it the Emerging Chef Program. So every quarter we identify local uh, chefs and bring them in um, and they get to take over the restaurant so that they get to uh, increase their chops in what it means to have 200 plates an hour um, and get introduced to a whole new uh, um, community. And then we've partnered with the county to do job training to um, reach out to the uh, people who are experiencing homelessness that population to give them training to get jobs in the restaurant industry. So there is a piece of that. And, and going back to, we feel that we are not just a cultural institution, but we have an equal identity as a civic institution and as an anchor institution. And we need to give back to our community on that civic front. So for instance, for um, the, uh, most recent presidential elections. Uh, we were a, a voting center um, in California. Um, you don't have to go to a specific place. You can go to any voting center. And so we opened it up in COVID even and had all these people come. We've been doing blood drives. We're looking into becoming a COVID vaccine dissemination spot. So having a real civic piece to it and the, the, we want the plaza to be a place where people can just come and hang. It's a piazza. It's a place to, and that's, that's really needed in LA because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of places just to sort of hang. But similarly, the park, which is a 12 acres right across the street from us, you know, we have lots of places for people to hang and, uh, you know, there's yoga and all sorts of things happening. And we have been dedicated to raising a bunch of money to provide free and low cost programming so that there's lots of stuff to activate the plaza and you can enjoy the music center and the, uh, the plaza, the park. I mean, you don't have to be super wealthy <laughs> to do it. Um, that it's not just the art that might appeal to you, but you can actually, you and your family can come and enjoy it. And you saw on the video, we have this great thing called um, DTLA dance, which is free um, every Friday during the summer, uh, non-COVID. And we have a, a dance teacher come and teach, you know, whether it's a, a merengue or whatever, and um, Bollywood 
Uh, and then we either have a live band or music, depending on what it is. And we'll get 5,000 people all dancing together. And what's so fun is that starts at around seven. People start showing up at the plaza about five and they camp out with their dinners and they bring picnics and it, it is a family affair and people are all up dancing together. And it is incredibly diverse and incredibly welcoming. Um, and it's um, just a, an incredible amount of fun. And what the best thing is when we have one of those big, you know, convenings of people dancing and all the theaters are going. And mm -hmm. so the theaters get out and you have this huge sort of mat mash of people from all sorts of different walks of life coming together and activating the space. And that is super fun. Uh, I can't wait to get back. <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, let's, let's broaden out the conversation a little bit because, you know, we've had a lot of, of, of conversation very appropriately for the past year on the role of like independent music venues and sort of not, you know, sort of a, a you know, a real um, much greater awareness about what, you know, the importance of kind of grassroots venues and neighborhood venues and, and sort of the ladder of venues and all that talk. And, and there's been a less discussion, I feel like about, you know, kind of the larger institutional performing arts centers, you know, other than concern that they're like gobbling up all the money and, you know, Kennedy Center got a bazillion dollars and, and things like that, you know, and, and Kennedy Center and, the, and some of the early relief act. And I, I think that a little bit of what maybe has been missed in that conversation is a lot of what you're talking about, the sort of re-envisioning of what these centers are and what the role is and how does that play out in terms of community engagement and, and what it really means to offer programming and, and be a welcoming space. And could you speak a little bit to kind of the more of the national conversation that you're part of and helping drive about not only what you do in LA, but there are echoes certainly of that in, in terms of what the Kennedy Center has been doing over the last decade in terms of their kind of, you know, rethinking their mission here in DC and, and others. Is this something, I mean, you're seeing as sort of a national conversation? Absolutely. Um, the performing arts centers across the country, I mean, the reality is the communities in which they exist have made huge investments in these large institutions. And it would be foolish to say the least to turn our backs on the large, these large investments. Um, it's more important that we drag them into the 21st century. And you know, some communities it's harder to do than others, obviously, um, because we've got uh, a very divided nation. But uh, increasingly the conversations are around how do we reimagine these buildings in ways that do provide value to the public. Uh, because regardless of where you are, we all um, are held in the public trust. We're 501c3s, we get you know, federal tax deduction um, and we raise money and we have an obligation to our public and uh, the public around the country. I mean, LA may be very diverse, but we are simply where LA, New York will be 15, 20 years from now. And so uh, the world's changing and we need to remain relevant and we really do not want to throw away these incredibly important buildings. And in an ideal world, it would be strengthening the partnerships between these institutions and the local arts organizations that exist. It's an important piece of the ecosystem and it is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about how, you know, what is our role in trying to support that ecosystem? Um, hiring artists I and mean, we were so excited that through this course of this year we've employed 600 artists on various projects uh, because making sure people have jobs is arts jobs is really important <laughs> um and so i think that 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 there's been a huge shift and i have got to say <clears throat> the um setting aside the saga around SOS and SVOG and, and how it may be rolling out um, impl being implemented, which is problematic to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, what was heartening for me is that this bipartisan bill invested $16.25 billion into the performing arts, the largest infusion of resource from the federal government into the performing arts sector in the history of this country. And the, bi bi the bipartisan element of it should not be uh, looked over. That whether it's Nashville and Mitch McConnell or Austin with Cornyn 
or Rubio, because Florida has the most performing arts centers in the country, um, as well as, of course, you know, I would expect Schumer, I would expect, you know, Klobuchar to be huge supporters of the arts. But to have these other folks who understand that these venues, whether they're commercial or nonprofit, are the lifeblood of a lot of communities. And they're going to be critical as we reopen to re um, basically revivify downtowns and communities. And, and also that these organizations are going to be critical in how we heal, you know, being able to come back together. I mean, the arts are so good at connecting people and generating empathy and joy and allowing us to work through our grief. You know, mental health has been taken a battering this past year and the arts are gonna be incredibly important for us as we try to get out of this catastrophic moment in our country. And just in, in, in closing, um... I'd love your thoughts, and I imagine you have some thoughts on this, but, you know, so so we do have this historic investment, and, and you're right, and we've talked about this. I mean, $16.25 billion, more money than the NEA and the NEH have had over 50 years combined. I mean, just a complete recalibration of, of money. But again, we don't want to, you know, long-term always be thinking about relief. We want to be thinking about reimagining and sort of, you know, forward motion and what this could and should look like moving forward. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about what you'd like to see from the administration as they come together to sort of what you would like to see in terms of Congress or the administration in terms of thinking about the arts ecosystem and, and what are those intersections and what would you like to see, you know, in an ideal world? Yeah, well, I certainly hope that the arts get a piece of the infrastructure discussion that is coming because I think that we are an incredibly important part of that. <clears throat> One of the things that I really think is high time for given this investment and given our role. I mean, just as an example, you know, the creative economies in California represent 8.2% of California's gross domestic, domestic product. That is huge. And innovation and creativity are one of the great um, differentiators of the United States from many other countries. You know, it is, it is our secret weapon and we need to support that. I really think there needs to be um, at a minimum, a senior person on the executive branch that can advocate for arts and culture, can help coordinate um, policies uh, alongside, you know, the NEA and the NEH and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and IMLS. Um, and, and really have conversations around copyright um, and immigration because we are so dependent upon visas and the uh, cross-fertilization of artists from different places and uh, tax policy. You know, how do those deductions work? I mean, and how do they, what are the implications for the arts as well as straight granting programs? And then you look at, um, uh, you know, the Department of Education and HHS and HUD and how nobody is at the table advocating for how their policies in these various departments are, impact the arts. And we need to have a voice. We need to be at the table. So if we can get somebody who is um, super smart and persuasive <laughs> um, to be advocating for our value. I think it would be incredibly important and it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rachel, I think that's spot on. And, um, and it's just so great to have you join us today and, and share a little bit about what's going on at Music Center and where you're going and, and kind of the broader, broader context. And that's a, a great transition point now to bring in Damon and, and Rebecca, because um, a lot of what Rachel was saying from a different have them wearing a different hat, I think, you know, dovetails with a lot of what you guys have been talking about for, for a bunch of years. Um, so, Rachel, thank you. I know you stick around as long as you can. I know you're going to have to jet in a second. Um, Damon, it is great to see you. Gates, it's always great to see you. I started to try to pull together some links that would be relevant context on a lot of the work that Damon has been doing for a long time. And my fingers started to hurt because there are so many things. But Damon is an author. Um, books including New Analog and Ways of Hearing. He also has created the Ways of Hearing podcast. He, of course, is a 
beloved musician uh, in many, many bands, including uh, Damon and Naomi, which he has been uh, in with his wife for quite some time. Um, they run a record label that has been kind of a vehicle for that work and other things. He also is an activist and has been thinking a lot about the structures of the community for a long time. He's got a recent um, uh, Betty published in the Boston Globe, along with our dear friend Joyce Linehan, looking at some of the compensation issues. And he's been very active in the union of musicians and allied workers. That's not bad, right? Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm feeling tired. That was. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, look I'm at that. Tired. Just, just copying and pasting links into chat. Um, and then Gates, of course, um, is a dear friend of the work that we've been doing forever. Uh, if you want to learn more about her, of course, you can always go check out her music and. If you uh, want to hear um, another example of her work with us, uh, you can check out her remarkable keynote interview with King County Executive Dow Constantine for the past Music Policy Forum Intensive. So welcome. Thank you both. Um, so let's just start um, picking up on something that Rachel was talking about in terms of the administration and a new day politically and just a lot of the host of issues that we um, are facing in the community in terms of, of everything you said, compensation structures, copyright, federal involvement, congressional oversight. Um, Damon, why don't you start and, and just talk a little bit about some of the themes that you were hitting in your in your piece with Joyce in the Globe from a couple of weeks ago, specifically yeah. looking at some of the, the Spotify streaming issues. Thank you. So interesting to hear the presentation about the way these overlap with, with issues for live work and theater and different media as well. Um, so uh, I've, I've been in quarantine, uh, I've been working with a bunch of mostly much younger musicians than I am to form a new union. We're not a formal union yet because we're 1099 workers, we're not W-2. And this is the classic kind of contemporary problem, we're gig workers. Um, but we feel uh, as musicians, the lack of protection for our labor, like all the victories that unions won over the 20th century to protect labor. Uh, don't apply to us. And um, we're suffering I, from the industry right now in new ways um, because of the consolidation of capital in a handful of tech companies that are dominating our business right now and, and with whom we have no um, negotiating power, zero. We don't even have a place at the table. And that's really why we're using the model of the labor movement because that's what we feel we're arguing for. We're arguing for a place at the table. We, Tech companies do not have to negotiate with musicians. They use our work. They only talk to the three major labels and a rarefied group within that uh, very large uh, conglomerates of, of people. And, and that's it. They never have to come to any of us. Uh, we're just like another consumer, um, although we are providing the content for the platforms. Um, so anyway, so a bunch of us have been putting together this group. It's called the Union of Musicians and Allied Workers allied workers, because part of the goal of this is to establish that music is labor and that we have a lot in common with labor in other fields. Um, to take the obvious example, especially with regard to legislation and regulation right now, um, we are very connected in, in our status now to gig workers in working for Uber or Lyft or all kinds of other internet businesses that have offloaded labor to freelancers and yet control all access to customers, all access to rate setting, all access to income, all access even to accounting, um, and, uh, and just leave us without, again, without any protections. So we, uh, we've been lobbying. First, we lobbied, our first action was to um, help lobby to, protect, to have gig workers protected by the Pandemic uh, Emergency Unemployment Act, which was great, because it actually happened. Um, I mean, we didn't cause it, obviously. We just joined on to a whole lot of many, many varied uh, groups lobbying for that. But it's been a lifesaver for those of musicians who could access it. Of course, not the undocumented and a lot of others of our colleagues that we worry about and are trying to think of how to help through this crisis. Um, our next big action was directed at Spotify specifically. It's called Justice at Spotify. You can find it on our website, unionmusicians.org, or hashtag Justice at Spotify if you search it. And uh, it's been very successful. We've had um, about 28,000 musicians and music workers have signed on to a petition demanding three main things from Spotify. One is to raise our royalty rates to a penny per stream. 
which doesn't sound extreme, but to Spotify, they say they'd be out of business tomorrow. Um, of course, Apple clearly hurt us because they just made a big press release saying they are paying a penny a stream. So we feel, um, we don't believe Apple's paying a penny a stream, but even the fact that they took our language and are promoting it as, as what they should be doing is uh, huge news for us and feels like something of a victory and a way to help leverage Spotify toward behaving more, at least in line with the rest of the market. They currently pay about a third of a penny per stream. Uh, so they'd be tripling their royalty exposure, supposedly, um, the, which relates to our second demand, which is transparency. No one knows how these companies work, where the money goes in, where it goes out. They get richer and richer and richer, and they keep reporting a loss every quarter. Um, you know, while meanwhile, they're capitalized to, I believe it's now $65 billion on the New York Stock Exchange. They're the most expensive office space in New York City. And they come to musicians and say, we can't afford to pay you more than a third of a penny per stream. And you're lucky you get that, which is really their attitude. If you read their uh, press releases and so much, so forth, which is also why we also chose them as a target because they drive the market, they pay us the worst and they treat us terribly and they put their foot in their mouths every time they open their mouth. So they are great, great, uh, like a uh, cigar chomping capitalist enemy caricature of themselves, which has proven very useful for us uh, in terms of um, publicity. Um, so that's what we've been up to. And um, we've started to think about how we could turn to Congress and lobby for help. Uh, again, because Spotify is not responding to us partly. Um, but we need, we need help. We need the um, clout of government and regulation and oversight above all over these companies that act like they are the government and they are the be all and end all of um, declaring how entire sections of our economy should work. And in music anyway, I can attest, it's not working at all. Uh, Spotify came out with numbers that they thought were bragging that said that 13 and a half thousand accounts globally are grossing $50,000 or more a year. 13 and a half thousand globally, 50,000 gross. Now we're talking gross, right? I mean, you all understand arts economies. That's not already, that's not minimum wage living for the artist. Um, we're talking about a label taking half of that. We're talking about sharing with bandmates, with managers, with, I mean, it's ridiculous. And that's their bragging point that this $65 billion company is grossing $50,000 for 13 and a half thousand, um, not even artists, but rights holders around the world, um, which we think is just shocking. I mean, that's not enough. I mean, they're in, they're in so many markets around the whole planet. They should be supporting um, a lot more. They should basically, basically be letting more money flow through. So, um, so that's where we're at. Uh, we're new at the congressional game, but we are, uh, have had some very nice supportive conversations with members of the House, where you're aiming at the Judiciary Committee, because this is their purview. And um, a couple of senators too, I'm in Massachusetts, so I have very good representation to call on. And uh, Joyce Linehan, our mutual friend, has been helping us as well. So that's where we're at. Yes, that's great. And, and bringing Rebecca into the conversation, I mean, there's just, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to play the old man card, but it's hard not to play the old man card because, you know, this is, we, we, we just recently, experience, I was going to celebrate, but I think experience is probably a better term for it, the 25th anniversary of the Telecommunications Act. And of course, for those of us in music, you know, buried in the Telecom Act was the, the pathway for what led to, you know, the, the you know, massive consolidation of commercial radio and, and basically the end of radio's relevance is, you know, commercial, commercial trustful radio's relevance for a music community. And you know, and, 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 and we've gone through these wars for a long time. Uh, we went through the pale wars and the echoes of this again are that corporations, they're gonna do what they do, right? I mean, this is not, you know, I mean, I appreciate the optics of the cigar chomping, but ultimately this is, this is capitalism and this is how do you maximize shareholder value? And you do that by you pay out as the least amount you can. And, you know, Rebecca, I know you've been thinking about these issues for a long time, um, just in terms of how can we organize? What's the sort of difference between catharsis and strategy? How can we actually be meaningfully effective, not just in the technology conversations, but just across the board in terms of elevating the sort of voice in the role of musicians? And I, I just love from your perspective, again, as someone who's been engaged in, 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 in the advocacy sort of conversations and, and infrastructure for a long time, 
what is your kind of sense of this moment? You know, does this feel different? Does it feel like the same conversations? Does it feel like we actually have an opportunity to, to really do some things differently? Um, I'll be speaking to you for the next five hours. No, <laughs> um, I think uh, <laughs> there's a, a Peter Bogdanovich film dance, eternal dance style scene coming up. I think, you know, it, there is a cyclical, we're always, there's, I think that the, as you know, as well as anyone, there's a cyclical element to these issues and things that come up. There's always Thanos trying to show up and steal all the marbles. There's always, um, you know, there's new technologies that come up. There's new opportunities. And I think that one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about um, is I've been so uh, nourished by the amount of networks that have come up in the last uh, year, 13 months, 14 months. Rachel mentioned some of that, of course, Revs, Neva, you know, there's just musicians, the union, like just, it, it is an opportunity to, um, to or, like organize or codify um, people who have been in the ecosystem for a long time and maybe haven't either had the capacity to engage in, in strengthening a network or haven't really had a common, um, common need to sort of step out of daily routine. Um, so I think that that's something that's really, uh, I'm excited about in this moment. Um, I think that there's, um, I'm always wondering about the role of the independent musician in whatever is happening. And by independent, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of that and spectrum of that definition, but particularly people who are doing all the work themselves, um, booking their own tours, putting out their own records, um, you know, having to navigate with, as Damon mentioned, like technology platforms that are the sides of like, not even nation states, they're like global states. Um, so there's different points of inflection in, in, in the ecosystem. And so I think I'm just, um, heartened and also we're at a point where we, we definitely need to be, um, doing antitrust work, you know, at a national level, we need to be, um, and we need to be bridging out in, in ways that make sense for us as musicians and um, into working with uh, institutions such as where Rachel is or um, different performing arts centers, you know, things that different, uh, different nonprofits have been thinking about in terms of network building and supporting each other. Um, you know, I mean, I am one of the things that I'm curious about and I, I, I wondered whether to bring this up, but you know, we're, we're, we're so concerned with venues and we should be like, and I think that that is like, I'm 1000% behind that. I also think that there should be an element of the conversation, which is once venues get going, you know, and those who've been able to make it, and hopefully we can get some more infrastructure funding going to or its organizations, whether they're, you know, nonprofit, larger institutions or small venues or SBA loans, whatever people need. But like, I would like to be offered more money than a hundred dollars to open for someone. You know, I would like to not be supporting an alcohol distribution system. I would like to, you know, I mean, so that's some of what's on my mind too, is there's, we have to, there's, there's an element of like, how can we also put musicians and music sort of front and center as we move into this sort of new phase? Yeah, I think that's, that's really well put, Rebecca. And I think part of what's so fascinating about the year, just to, to, to piggyback on what you're saying, is it, it, it feels on the one hand like everything is being recalibrated because, I mean, not only obviously because of the pandemic and, and just everything that everybody's been going through collectively, but also, again, the sort of organic rise of the new advocacy networks and of the, the sort of political engagement around it. And of course, $16.25 billion put in a stake in the ground about, you know, sort of what many people have assumed would be sort of the limits of, of federal investment. Um, at the same time, it feels like there's, a little bit more clarity around, you know, these concepts in the language we use at Music Policy Forum is, you know, the kind of ongoing pursuit of, of stronger, more resilient, more equitable music scenes, you know, music ecosystems, and what does that mean in practice? And part of what I love about today's conversation, and I'm so happy to have the three of you on, is because you can't, you know, I think it's a, it, it, it's a real mistake, and it's been a real mistake in our community for a long time to not engage the structural. Right. And, and part of, again, the work that Damon and, and Damon's colleagues are doing is so critical 
because as you see, you know, Lena Khan, you know, on the on the way to be confirmed to be at the Federal Trade Commission, and the ability to have these new conversations about platform domination and how do we rethink monopoly policy and what is that, you know, what are fair marketplaces look like, you need to be able to inform those conversations with practitioners who can actually talk about it, you know, in substance and, and really understand the industry. So you don't have to take for granted, you know, like we're just going to get screwed on the on the rates and we're just going to work around that. No, we can engage in that. We also can be engaging in the practical conversations about you know the fact that we're going to have a 1.8 trillion dollar infrastructure package. That's money they're going to spend that should be spent on cultural infrastructure and on resources and not just on physical space, but on the types of things Rebecca you're talking about. And 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 I love you know we've seen a lot of conversations. And actually, Rachel, I don't want to put you back in the spot, but since you're here, I, I think it dovetails nicely what you're talking about, Rebecca. Your point about many musicians feeling like they are just dragged into this sort of, um, you know, marketplace around certain types of shows at certain types of times at night that are really vehicles, again, for people who want to go out and drink and have a good time and all that. And that becomes your place as opposed to some of the community events that you see at the plaza or you see, you know, other presenters offering, like, how do we make music more accessible for different types of experiences that, you know, are, are less prioritized and certainly less resourced. Um, so, you know, that's a lot, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to, to go off on, on those tangents and, and obviously, um, certainly audience members who have questions or comments for these folks, throw them into the Q and A. Um, so sort of pragmatically, what do the next couple months look like? Again, Damon, again, for your work, for the organization, you know, as we move into reopening, as the administration comes together, what are sort of the immediate next steps that, that you all are thinking about? Well, specifically about reopening, uh, we have a, a subcommittee devoted to venues and venue issues. And um, we have a, a, an active uh, local chapter already in Chicago, our first local. And they, uh, interestingly, they started polling, uh, Chicago starting to reopen, of course, there's pressure everywhere. They called together a bunch of venue workers in a meeting to poll their attitudes. And they did not get a single positive endorsement for reopening from anybody who works at the, at the indie venues in Chicago. Meanwhile, of course, they're all going back to work because they have to. So I think this is um, you know, something that we're looking at is how we can enter this conversation and try and influence it and do some good for um, what's ahead. Obviously, there's so much unknown that's ahead and we want to support independent venues survival, which may depend on reopening, obviously. But at the same time, it seems like there are a lot of workers that are being um, unheard and who just have no options and no choices in the, in the situation. And musicians too. I mean, there's so much pressure to, to just like go back like nothing changed and start, I mean, there are tours and now so they just sort of make me a little sick to look at the, at the calendar and think about um, how this could possibly be. And then I also think I'm not, at the age and in my career stage in my career where I have pressure on me to, to, to rush out on the road like that. But I think back and I think how much pressure I've been under in my life to do that under good circumstances, so-called good circumstances. <laughs> and then like the pressure that would be there now, is just horrible. You can't say no, you know, cause everybody always says to you in the industry, it's like, if you say no, you'll never get asked again. I mean, that's kind of the attitude. And so your booking agent is going to pressure you, your manager is going to pressure you, your bandmates might be pressuring you, your label is going to be pressuring you. And yourself, you bring pressure on yourself because you're like, well, this is what I said I wanted to do, right? And, um, you know, musicians have a long history of unhealthy decisions. And I just worry about um, that playing into this as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not on the venues committee, but, that, but I know that those are the, you know, things we're looking to in terms of reopening. For our streaming campaign, as I said, we're, we're looking at, at um, at uh, how we can how we can now intersect with government. Yeah, that's interesting. Something I, I think you both have also touched on, which is going to be a real interesting question for this administration, um, is the future of work. And I know we have a lot of, of optimism. Um, a former neighbor of yours, uh, Marty Walsh, has now taken over at Department of Labor, and by all indications, is a. I mean, tell me about what, what we know about about Marty Walsh and. Rachel, I don't know if you intersected with him in, in uh, your Boston days, but yeah. I mean, what, what should we look for, for from Secretary Walsh, Damon? Well, he's a union man. I mean, that's just the greatest thing. I mean, he's a throwback in a lot of ways um, because he comes out of a very pro 
strong labor era. Um, and I think that's his background. Uh, Joyce Linehan was his chief of policy in Boston while he was mayor, which was amazing because they instituted a lot of arts programs, uh, which Joyce had no small hand in. And, uh, but they were really successful. Um, I mean, you know, simple public facing things can, can mean so much like Boston City Hall, for those of you who don't know, is a brutalist, um, I, to me, monstrosity. There, a lot of people now have a kind of a backwards, uh, kind of like nostalgic love for it. But it's this brutalist thing, like stomped down in the middle of, of the center of the city that had a long standing um, kind of hostile relationship physically with the city. And um, they opened it up and held music performances in it, in, 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 the, in this unhospitable, massive entry hall of concrete, echoing concrete. And of course, who could do that the best? Some really experimental avant garde musicians who used the crazy acoustics of the space. And it was, what, but what was really beautiful about it was to see just people in the space in a very inhumane, I've always thought of an inhumane space. Sorry to pass judgment on brutalism. Um, but, um, but populating it in a way that you don't usually see. And it really did humanize uh, the building. You know? And then also, of course, achieve this wonderful kind of proximity to government that, again, the building sort of has the opposite attitude. Like, don't come in here unless you, you must. And uh, this was like, well, people just hanging out, you know, listening to, to like strings strung all the way across the entire uh, span of the ceiling and plucked and, and amplified. So yeah, that was great. So, you know, I think um, we can look forward to a, obviously the change from before is just night and day, but I think also we can look forward to a kind of a resurgence that I'm feeling at large of the labor movement altogether. I mean, it's coming from every sector, from places I never would have thought, from music writers, from you know, this is all these unions, uh, uh, an independent label, a secretly grouped in uh, Indiana, just their workers just uh, organized. It's amazing. Yeah. And sort of one last question is, is sort of a big picture question. If, if we take, you know, as, as a presupposition, what I was saying earlier, that part of government's job is, you know, to police a fair, you know, sort of, you know, commercial marketplace and, and have rules and regulation and, and laws to make sure that everybody can kind of compete fairly. The other part of the job, it feels like in the culture space is to identify where just fundamentally it's not going to happen in the marketplace, that they're just pieces of art and culture that just don't fit anymore uh, or, or never did fit and, and really need to be supported again through through policy and funding and, and infrastructure. I'd just be curious what kind of things, again, we talked about before in art centers, what are some other sort of areas where you would see that it's just, let's just give up the fight. I mean, we had the conversation a couple weeks ago about should libraries be coming up with alternate streaming services, you know, or should this be the future of public media? Should, should public media, um, you know, be building out their own platform? I mean, what are some of the things that, that come to mind when we think about both short term with this infrastructure bill and then sort of moving the conversation forward? Either of you. Well, I'll just jump in because I do have a quick thing about libraries. There is a proposal on the table but built by a, by a music lawyer in his spare yeah. time. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. For a national streaming library. It's yeah. fascinating. No, like a Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, right exactly. Yeah. So just, and Rebecca plays all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think another thing that that is, there's a couple things that are on my mind. And one is that um, uh, in terms of not only things that are sort of like, how are we going to support these things that existed that are no longer part of the marketplace? How are we going to preserve a place for musicians in the marketplace? Um, and I, I mean, I, you know, I can't believe that just came out of my mouth, but it is really in order to be able to do our work. So say, you know, if, if uh, as, as live shows start happening again, and there's going to be some sort of hybrid of um, online performance, you know, which, which musicians have cultivated themselves. Like, how do we maintain ownership of that? How do we not be involved? Does that start going into 360 deals? You know, as well, can we keep that on ourselves? How are we gonna push back against venues? If I'm like, I wanna have my computer and I'm doing this, but you get the room, you know? And I think that there, I'm, I'm as much thinking about that sort of like what's possible over the next six months to a year as, as the the past and and sort of the present, and I think um, part of part of what's going to what's wonderful about the work that Damon and and the folks there are doing, as well as um, other you know groups coming together, is that there's continues to need to be um, strategies for musicians to engage and for there to be conversations with performing institutions and culture institutions. Um, so, what shape does that look like? Um, 
as that develops. I think um, documenting what's happening now uh, with opening, like Damon mentioned they're doing in Chicago. There's something that we've talked about here um, um, that we hopefully will get together over the next couple months, uh, working in conjunction with different, you know, it's just this really important to capture like what people's experience are and not just sort of get caught up in this reopening. And maybe we do just go into reopening and then have like a, okay, February, 2022, we're gonna do some forensics and we're gonna actually really dig in now that there's a little bit more motion. Um, and I love what Rachel said about culture centers, recognizing that they that they need to be civic centers too, that this is all really tied together and, um, and that's exciting. So I think I think that's, there's a lot to, to get to and there's a lot to take care of, but there's a lot of people who are on board and it feels like even more and more people are, are coming into the, into the, um, to that task. So that's, I'm encouraged. Yeah, I, I also, Rachel, I found it amazing when you said how, you know, we can't just go back. We have to acknowledge, you know, the, the digital realm also, as well as our change situation from the pandemic. And I think that's really a, a really important thought for all of us. But again, I think unfortunately the industry does just want to snap back. I mean, the commercial side of it, um, at least that's how it looks to us in music. And I think we, in some ways we need to resist that even as we need to also kind of aid it because of course this is our livelihood as well. It's a complicated situation. But yeah, I don't think it can go back. I don't think it should go back because I think also climate change is, is hanging over all our heads. And like the normal way of touring is the most carbon uh, you know, consuming activity. It's not, it shouldn't be our norm that we're like reaching back for tour buses. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, ultimately a lot of what this year has taught us uh, or reminded us and, and, and brought to the fore again is that music, certainly in a policy context for a long time has, has really been thought of as a competitor against, you know, TV or film or video games or sports, or it's been looked at through a consumer lens in terms of how do people want to put money in an ecosystem and who gets to then share the proceeds coming out. And that's a very natural sort of evolution of what happened with, again, the, all the mergers starting in the 70s and sort of integration of music from being privately held businesses into larger conglomerates that do deal in all these different areas. And so they look at it sort of, you know, from those from that standpoint. And, and I think, you know, I mean, it, it, it's unfortunately taken losing music in, in the pandemic. And Rachel said it really well, you know, to remind us that music is not a widget. You know, music is not a commodity or entertainment music is, is us, it's who we are. And, and I'm gonna, you know, in closing, I'm gonna put one more, one more piece that, um, that Damon wrote a couple of years ago for Pitchfork that I, I just thought was really thoughtful. It's, you know, sort of the, I, I think piece around how to be a responsible music fan in the age of streaming. And I think that gets to the work that we all are doing, which is how can we all be responsible no matter what hat we're wearing, whether we work in policy and government, whether we work in philanthropy, in the NGO sector and industry, we all hopefully have this sense of intention and purpose around, again, how do we make stronger, more resilient and more equitable music scenes? And what does that look like when we all put all the pieces together, trying to move this thing forward, not taking things for granted, just taking it. Yep, and, and Damon, your, your point in chat, I think fans and audiences are ready and they're eager and we can have that, that conversation. Um, so this has been great. I really appreciate Rachel, Damon, Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Again, thank you for all the attendees who are with us um, as always. We love your feedback. Please um, hit us up with questions, comments, suggestions, very kindly worded constructive criticism, musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Uh, next week, we're celebrating International Jazz Day with uh, Dave Ankers, the pro program director at WWOZ and a bunch of others. Have a safe weekend, a productive weekend. Good luck with the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant portal, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.